Hey, what is up everyone? It's Rich. All right, welcome to Super Fun Sunday. Today we are going to take a look at Joe Matarera, X-Men. Uncanny X-Men. Some of these issues I've never seen. I was actually surprised because I thought in my collection I had everything that he had done on the X-Men. But he had done a lot more issues than I thought. I would say I had probably 75% of them, but there was definitely a few that I didn't. Um, I kind of grabbed the greatest hits from, from the pages and just grabbed stuff. There was so much to choose from that I, I felt like, let's just look at a little bit of everything. Um, there's a cover gallery that will hit at the very end, uh, so you definitely want to stay tuned for that. And then, um, so this is, this is going to be really, really fun. Joe's great. This is really where he came into his own. And I know for people that were collecting this at the time when it was coming out, it was actually very, very exciting. Joe was incredibly popular and uh, incredibly influential. You know, we know where his influences come from, Capcom. Uh, you know, a, a lot of that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, he really was one of the um, people that brought it into American comics. And uh, for that, we do owe him a debt of gratitude. So, all right, quick housekeeping. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Please hit like on my videos. If you could share them, that would be huge. I'm trying to build the channel. I see other comic book channels gaining ground on me, passing me. Um, you know, I need your support. There's no reason that we can't make this bigger. And look, the bottom line is Blaster Kid is in your hands. This channel is is the hinge that will open that door. So I need your support. So anyway, and then also, if you want to check out Patreon, I have probably between five and 600 videos up on Patreon. Lots of tutorials, lessons, um, things on anatomy, perspective, drawing, you name it. I've covered it probably multiple times. Uh, you won't be bored there. And then on top of it, I do comic reviews and also just inspirational videos um, to get you on point. If you're drifting in your focus, discipline, schedules, you name it. This is all kinds of stuff. So, all right, let's get into this. Full screen mode. Joe Matarera. This is from 1997. Um, the last issue that Joe worked on was 350. He would generally work in three to four issue chunks uh, and then take an issue or two off and then sort of revamp. Some of the stuff is fairly simple and some of it is much more detailed. This is a beautiful piece. Mark Morales sinks on this. He did a very, very nice job. Tim Townsend is probably the inker that most people would be familiar with on Joe's Uncanny X-Men work. But Dan Green was actually his first inker on it um, with uh, another inker, I think, whose last name was Caballero. So, yeah, the first issue that Joe did uh, was Dan Green and, and Caballero, I believe. And that would have been um, in either... Uh, late 94 or maybe early 95. Sorry, let's get into this. This is going to be fun. Okay. I have this comic. So, who knows? Maybe the covers are going to come up first. I'm not sure how this will go in order. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. It doesn't really matter. Again, this is, this is about two years worth of work uh, that Joe did at Marvel. And uh, I'm really excited to see this because... Joe didn't fully come on my radar, although I did have uh, radar. Um, I, I, I did have the Deadpool miniseries that he did, um, but uh, I didn't really go back and look at this stuff until after he was working on Battle Chasers. Battle Chasers sold me on Joe, and then I came back and looked at this stuff. All right, cool. So we're going to go through the covers. That's fun. So I don't have this one. I didn't have this issue. Never have even seen the piece. Again, just classic, classic combination of Tim Townsend and Joe Mad. It's really cool. I have this one too. I didn't really like this cover that much. I don't know. There was it was weird. There was there was a point where even J. Scott Campbell, I think, suffered from this a little bit. Is is they got further into their runs on their books. Um, there were so many people copying their work that their work started to sometimes look a little bit like 
it was weird. Like, like uh, if they weren't completely on their game, their stuff would start to drift into looking like some of the people like Al Rio or Roger Cruz, you know, depending on who uh, you're talking about. Um, but yeah, like this cover never felt fully like Matarera to me. It's it's got his isms, but I know it is. Um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's like even Joe sometimes would drift from his own um, more more iconic style. I definitely have this issue. This is fun. I'm actually, it was funny because I was like a little bummed that the covers looked like they were going to come up last. So this is a fun way to kind of get into it. Lots of storytelling pages, double page spreads, splash pages. It's going to be good. Joe does a great Spider-Man. And in fact, you know, he went back and ended up working for Marvel o over the last like 10 years and did some stuff. So he returned back home. I have this one. Divided they shall fall. Really, really nice. It's tough to draw faces like this and um, have them not look weird. Like for a girl's face to have such a large nose and things like that, it all kind of needs to work together. Um, like a nice symmetry between it. And uh, Joe really hits that with these pieces where it's she still looks attractive. Um, you know, she's got big hands fairly large head I mean it can really kind of get away from you this is a classic inking technique that was very very popular and sometimes time-consuming you know pencils would throw this in the background of just about everything <laughs> nowadays it's everybody uses the um, clip studio crosshatch brush and that's what they fill the background with um, so it's but this was done the old-fashioned way elbow grease I don't think that I have this issue. It's nice. Nice cover. Look, you know, this is the other thing, too, is is you want to talk about a couple of artists, Tim and Joe. These guys made bank on this series. I can't even imagine. Like, like comic sales were starting to go down after the mid-90s, so 95 to 98 sales were plummeting. But, but you're on Uncanny X-Men drawing these characters. You're probably doing pretty well for yourself. So, um, you know, this is where you wanted to be. If you were going to be a Marvel and not be an image, you definitely wanted either Spider-Man or, or an X-Men book. So I think, you know, or something Wolverine related. Those would have been probably the strongest titles to generate income. And I bet this book sold pretty well, you know. Okay, so here we're going to get into some of the sequentials. I was real curious to see um, the sequential art on this. It's been a long time since I've looked at these comics. And uh, some of it, again, is, is pretty simple and pretty open. And, um, you know, it's always fun to see how they, um, how someone like Joe handled things. His work got much more detailed as he went along. These are on real deadlines, though. These are Marvel deadlines in the 90s. And, you know, he probably had four weeks to draw one of these comics. You just can't mess around. You know, if you if you don't allocate your time accordingly, you're going to be, you know, getting in trouble or getting pulled off the book or, or, you know. That was a big stipulation when I got hired at Wildstorm is... Everybody, the class of early image, had had so many deadline problems that they really made it very upfront that we weren't going to be able to uh, enjoy that same um, same uh, benefit. I'm just going to check something really fast. I want to make sure OBS is still recording. Yeah, okay. I had it crash the other day, and it was like my mouse. The uh, I need to switch. I need to get a new mouse. So. But I just want to make sure that we were still getting audio. So I would hate to finish this video and have it not have recorded. But yeah, so I would imagine that Marvel probably handled business in a similar fashion, which is, look, we love your work, but this stuff has to make it to the retailers on time. Uh, we're going to have a problem. And you'll have a bigger problem because we won't use you. Now, for pencilers and writers that are very, very popular, there's probably a little bit more wiggle room. Although, I mean, usually you're part of a team. This almost doesn't feel like Matarera to me. This could be a film page. I don't know. It looks a little like Joe. It kind of doesn't look like Joe. So, I don't know. 
could be a different inker. You know, that's that is how much of an effect of things like that can have. Okay, this is definitely a joke. I have this comic. Um, but yeah, so pretty interesting. And you figure what's what's really wild about the, at this day and age too is is Joe would have to FedEx these pages to Tim Townsend, who I think lives in Florida. And I don't remember where Joe Joe lived, but I would I would think maybe somewhere in New York or New Jersey. Um, so you know what I mean? It's kind of funny. It's like you'd finish pages on Thursday, FedEx them overnight to your inker, you know, in Florida. He would ink them, and then odds are most people didn't have scanners at home back then either. Although who knows, maybe Tim did, um, or eleven by seventeen scanner, and and he he may have actually sent the pages to Marvel where they scanned them and then a few months later they would split up the art you know where all of a sudden you get a box and your editor had gone through and split up the pages or you can sometimes collaborate with your penciler and do it that way people always ask generally speaking the pencil and inker will decide how they want to split up the art it's a two-third one-third split generally i have worked with inker or pencilers that do 50 50 which is very very generous um, but, uh, yeah, usually it's a two third, one third split. So, you know, you can pick back and forth. There's a lot of different ways to do it. This Wolverine face is great. I actually kind of like the color too, actually on this panel in particular, not, not so much some of the other ones. That's a little too, too many, like, I don't know, orange, green, blue. It's, this is nice. It's interesting too. Let's turn this one gray for a second. I want to see something. When you remove all the, um, like, sculpting that the colorist did, you really do see just approximately how simple kind of this stuff is. There's not as much detail as you might think, you know, and um, it's still, it, this is still a detailed piece, and this would definitely take a day to do, but, um, you know, but, you know, you can kind of get an idea of what it might have looked like in black and white. It would obviously be more clear, but... Um, yeah, and then watch when we go back how much is going on with the anatomy, you know, like all the little highlights and stuff. What? <laughs> this is such a funny rendering style, like on the cheek. Oh, it must be on my dodge tool. I could tell by the... But yeah, this is like such a... I hated, I, I never ever thought that that looked good on cheeks. It's funny because I would ink pencilers that would do that. And it just always looked bad to me. It's just too, I don't know. It just, just doesn't work for me. It looks like a, I don't know, like a fence or something. I get what it's trying to indicate though, to be clear, but oh, I just never liked it. This is cute. Nice inks on this piece. Really, really nice. Man. It's funny because this has a little bit of a Bacalo vibe. Bacalo was working on Gen X at this point, I think. He did do some on Kenny X-Men, but he may have followed Joe on it. In fact, I kind of think that he did. But Bacalo was definitely in the Marvel stream at this point. Bacalo went over to Marvel in around like 94. Oh man, this is nice. Wow, oh, this is a really, really cool page. Love this. Woo! Man, that is cool. I love the lighting on this guy. Let's turn it grayscale. I can kind of admire the. I'm not going to go nuts and try to move it all, but we'll get it a little closer to what it looks like. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Man. Yeah, that's neat. You know, Joe's work is very, very fun. He really captured sort of the spirit of his influences. Cartoons, video games. It's kind of all in there with his work. And then really, really great comic art. You know, he hit it all. It was interesting when they did the cliffhanger line, which was Umberto Ramos, J. Scott Campbell, and um, Matt Herrera initially, and then Bucklow was the fourth uh, about a year later. But um, 
those dudes were were legit you know they were the top some of the top guys mike turner definitely was up there too but it was interesting because it's kind of like um the luke skywalkers had become jedi at that point so you know you had your obi-wan kenobis which was jim lee Silvestri, whoever would have been at marvel that was still remaining you know like the sort of the godfathers of that era the 80s to the 90s but yeah you had all the young 90s artists really flourishing at that point and um bringing some pretty incredible this is a nice drawing man i want to see this one grayscale too this is really cool i know kitty you like joe matarero also really really nicely done man he may have worked this out small and then light boxed it up big i, I think it would be a, a pretty good way to uh keep things sort of where you didn't have gigantic vanishing points and whatnot Oh, I always like this character. This is nice. Inking is a little questionable back here. This definitely is not Townsend. <laughs> or at least I wouldn't think so. Yeah, that doesn't look like Tim. Tim is much more accurate with his rendering. Like here you can see. Oh, boom. Cool. We'll look at this uh, still a very very nice page though you know I, and this is i've talked about this in lessons and stuff like that 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 for more um beginner and early intermediate inkers people that put a lot of black in their pencils will support your sort of lack of of quality control on your lines so um as a for instance i would say like david finch's work is very very forgiving the reason that it's so forgiving is it's so solid he really creates very solid form so if you can outline things okay and just fill in his blacks your line work can look pretty shitty and he'll kind of make you look okay i mean if you really look at the stuff up close it won't it'll, the line work will be um bad if you don't do good feathering or cross hatching and whatnot but uh his stuff is pretty pretty forgiving too so and that's not a knock i mean it's just it's it's a a recommendation where it, those those people will will maybe help you learn more this is nice really nice try it's funny because baklo did a piece very similar to this in uh, steampunk in fact really really similar i i have the original <laughs> oh man that's cool damn what is going on xavier geez louise you got all beat up this looks slightly more earlier from him but i could be wrong his issues definitely fluctuated in terms of, of how how on it he was. So, again, I think that probably was reflective of Deadline. Look, it's Gully. <laughs> that's funny, right? Man, that's crazy. He probably... It's probably from either an anime or an, a manga thing, and he's just kind of carried it over uh, from there into Battle Chasers later. So this video today is not going to be super long. I'm going to try to keep it at about 30 minutes. I'm going to kind of watch the clock a little bit because I've got a lot to do today. And um, I, you know, I just don't think that, that uh, from what I've seen on my numbers, people just don't stick out long videos. I know some do, but there's plenty of long videos on my channel if you want to head that route. But I think 20 to 30 minutes is plenty. We can always come back to it. We could do single issues or, or whatever, but oh man, it's really nice. I've done Battle Chasers multiple times, so if it's not on the YouTube channel, if you head over to my Patreon, you could search Matarera as a hashtag and definitely find at least one or two um, Matarera videos I've done. Always down with Joe. Man, this is cool. His saber tooth is really cool. I actually caught up with the Mandalorian last night. It was kind of fun. I hadn't seen episode two or three from the second season yet, so it's kind of drifting in the third the third episode. Though I need to go back and watch it. Um, I was like started messing around with my phone, and then I was like checking out. <laughs> Shame on me. I don't know. This doesn't really look like Joe. 
how that is though. Man, that's cool. <laughs> wow. I wonder who has this original, if Joe or Tim, or if it's been sold. Look, Pac-Man. What's going on with that little Pac-Man there? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it somewhere this original art exists, and that's always fun. This is almost starting to teeter into the liquid style coloring. I don't know if this is uh, one of the liquid guys or not, but uh, you, you can kind of see shades of that that look coming in. It could have been something that sort of Joe Joe um, started to ask for. You know, maybe he had seen little bits and pieces of it, and it could just be the way that it's drawn. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd be curious of how that evolution of that came about. Oh, it's so good. Man, look at that. That is such a kick-ass spread. It looks like he did the little sort of like, you know, flip your image thing as it's, it's kind of, you know, it's got that vibe, but, but there's enough stuff that's randomized and whatnot. Um, and I'm sure the inks weren't. So, I mean, it's not like a photo stat of the finished inks. Doesn't look to be, no. Uh -huh. But you know, it actually is. How funny. Yeah, this is actually flipped. If you look at the debris right here, it's the same exact debris on this side. Hmm. It's weird. I don't know if I would have done that personally. I would have I would have fought it out and just done I mean, even if you laid it out in pencil where you did that, I would have uh redrawn um the sides so that they would be different, put in different windows and stuff like that. The structure could be symmetrical, but I would I would have had the detail be different. That's weird. Yeah, looking up here. <laughs> it's always fun to kind of try to re reverse engineer this stuff. But you know, here's the deal, because because it's it's easy as someone just looking at the art to be critical of it as a fan or as a an aspiring comic book artist, whatever you want to call it, like a viewer that didn't draw the piece. <coughs> Again, there's deadlines. This is a job, you know. Sometimes the attitude is what will get the job done and in on time and if something will save time and let you draw something else better maybe it's worth it <coughs> sorry it's very dry here today dry and hot i this is cool man so i've loosened my um what would you call it my opinion on things like that because i do get it Was, there was a bit of advice that I was going to give my patrons yesterday. I was going to shoot a video, and I kind of was like, eh, should I do it or not? I didn't know if it was a long enough topic, but I can throw it in here. But it's, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to take a sip of water really quick. Um, it's easy to be a fan of someone who doesn't draw a lot of stuff. Like, you could be a fan of a great artist whoever it is, a comic book artist, an illustrator, whatever, whatever the person is. But you have to look at your goals with your work and what sort of timeline your work is going to be expected on. If, if, if your favorite comic book artist is someone that does five covers a year and maybe draws a comic every two or three years, um, then how are you going to expect to be able to do what they do and and produce more? You get what I'm saying? It's like if you love Arthur Adams, just as an example. You know, art does maybe one piece a month. It could be more, but but you know what I mean? Like, uh, it, you know, you're going to need to be aware of that because to try to do 20 pages in a month and, and have that level of detail, I mean, you can go for it and give it a shot. It's definitely, I mean... I wouldn't discourage you, but you, you, you have to be aware of that. You know, it's like, I love this and this and this. And it's like, great. Well, are you producing any art at that level? Are you able to meet any deadlines with those influences? Because it's great to like stuff. You could like whatever you want. It doesn't matter. But you're going to need to come up with a conclusion of, of what you're going to do and how much work you want to produce in the year. This is very Rob Liefeld. That's funny. Um <laughs> I don't think this is Joe. 
I don't know. The way Eve, the way that it's rendered on the body and stuff like that looks, doesn't look very Joe. Um, this doesn't look like Joe too. What's funny? I saw the small thumbnail of this and I was like, this is gonna be an interesting. Video. You know what? Maybe it is Joe. This silhouette actually does look a little like Joe. This doesn't look like Joe. This could also be affected by the inkers. If this is the Dan Green or um, Caballero video or uh, comic that I was talking about, then it's possible. But yeah, so it was, it was just I was going to point that out to people because like, like I saw an Adam Hughes Hellboy issue um, yesterday. I read it. It was really, really good. you know. But Adam only draws really maybe one comic book a year. And I'm not saying that he spent you know 10 months on, on that issue, but, but he may have spent four to six just planning it. it doesn't mean that the drawings took that long but maybe the ideas did maybe the layouts did maybe getting the reference together did you know what i mean you have to be aware of that stuff because it's gonna if you if you're not realistic with things you're gonna find yourself constantly disappointed in the quality of work that you produce because you're not approaching it the same way as them there's an artist that is pretty popular i would i mean i think he's very popular I talked about it before. I won't say his name, um, but I'm nearly sure that that almost any of the figure work that he does is 3D models. Um, he's never he's never said it. He's never uh, referenced it, but I can see it in his comic book work that he does, meaning the sequentials and things that he do. He he's just the work is too consistent and it's it's stiff in a weird way. The, the environments kind of have that feel too. I do believe that the person can draw. I just think that, that a lot of the heavy lifting is done that way. Uh, but even when they do little drawings just to share on Instagram, I still think that they're using it. But you know, if you're a fan of that person and you're trying to draw at that level and you're not using those tools, then it's, it's kind of probably not gonna click completely. Like I said, Pepe, Pepe LaRoz is amazing. I'm really, really blown away by like the level of quality that that guy has. But he clearly can draw his ass off. You can go to his art dealer's uh, site. And he's got prelims. And, and it looks to me like he does his prelims 8.5 by 11 on pen, like pencil on paper. And then he goes in and finishes them digitally. But he's so fucking good. But I, I he, he might use a little bit of 3D... Um, like templates and stuff like that, but he's drawing all the stuff. It's, it's pretty obvious. He's so good. Oh my god. He said if I knew his work a little better, that was who I was gonna do today. But uh, I'm just starting to really kind of know his work. This is great, man. Joe is killing it on this. Jerome Pena is another guy that I want to do a video of, and he's another one that just can draw his ass off. If there's no doubt in my mind that that dude is a beast. Would be fun to go through Laniel Yu's early Marvel work. Not earliest, earliest, but, but you know, first few years, uh, uh, like when he got rolling. It's, it's pretty interesting watching him um, assimilate styles. Man, that is such a great figure. So cool. It's funny because this is like, you could see like Ed McGinnis like vibing off of stuff like this. This is very similar to how Ed McGinnis ultimately ended up drawing uh, 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 kind of around this time. Ed's really good. Ed would be an interesting, like, it would be fun to go back and revisit, like, his majestic work. This is really good. But see, this this would be, like, if you are a fan of this kind of art, this, this to me is someone who's drawing pages, someone who is on a deadline, someone who probably was doing nine books a year, maybe ten. So this is a reachable goal. J. Scott Campbell early on was actually really productive. Uh, he became less productive on Danger Girl, but he was putting a tremendous amount of heavy lifting into the layouts and research for Danger Girl. Uh, and he also was, at that point, kind of running a business, even though he was still at Wildstorm. But, I mean, he had a lot going on. But uh, Danger Girl is quite quite detailed, and, and he would draw so tight. This is so awesome. Man, it's good. But yeah, look at what I just said is encouragement and not discouragement. You really, really just want to pay attention to uh, your influences if if you have um, you know goals that uh, are going to want to keep you moving. 
because my concern would be for people is is that you want to make a living doing comics um so you're going to need to produce enough where you can afford to do it oh this is like early 3d models this is funny i remember this it actually looks cool but it is it's kind of funny but i i forgot about this issue this is funny I don't know who did this, who created the um, the actual model that's in the the comic, or, or how it was done. It it could have been the colorist. It's it's neat. I think it's a neat effect. We may see more of it. I don't remember if I open more pages of it. This is cool. Joe draws great rocks, like his mountains and stuff like that are fun. They're stylish. They're kind of suggesting, suggestive, but really cool. Yeah, you can see like the inks on this aren't at the Tim Townsend level, and so it makes the structure of the drawings just look so weird. But it also is is a credit to to how good Tim is, because this does not look good. It makes Joe's drawings actually look bad, <laughs> and we know that's not necessarily the case because Joe Joe uh, has been drawing good really since he's been in comics. You might have more favorite parts, but in generally, generally speaking, it's pretty damn good. Yeah, that's cool. Who are some artists that were heavily, heavily influenced by Joe that you still see around? Are there any that are still out there? Or even new artists that you see that have the Matarera sort of flavor? It would be kind of fun to check out how it, uh, incorporates into their work. I like how he, he uh, renders the uh, costumes. Looks cool. Some of these more simple pages. I definitely have this comic. Slambo. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen that as a word balloon. Bop and Slambo. Kind of got a little bit of Arthur Adams feel there. Man, art's so good. Oh, this is nice. I love this page. I definitely have this comic. Man, it's so good. Really, really great profile. This is great, too. The lighting here is neat. Like, man, he really, uh, you know, it's like the drama and tension is building, and then the reaction is, like, all lit up. It's a really nice little uh, juxtaposition of light. I'm not a hundred percent sure if I would it, it would it would maybe I would second guess myself now I wouldn't but um if I had so much shadow on a face here I'm not sure that I would pull all that black out it might trip me out where I would think that oh it's gonna look weird you know why was he so shadowed and then all of a sudden he wasn't Let's see if we can do this. okay so let's check out the page it's a nicely balanced page though. Oh, okay. I see. He's got the dark here. He's kind of, he's, it's interesting. It's like mystery. She's doing stuff. You're getting more information. You know, she's still continuing to do stuff. A little more mystery. And then this sort of reaction, like a reveal. It's really, really good. Subtle. I, you know, I, I'm sure that Joe worked closely with his editors and learned a lot, um, you know, about storytelling. We had some great uh, editors at, um, Wildstorm. I remember um, talking to them and just really like, man, they were legit ed editors back then. You know, people that that had really followed comics, had gone to college, and and you know, a lot of them had some artistic ability too. But those are really really powerful editors. It's not just someone that um, I don't know. You know, I mean, there's there's a difference between a great editor and then someone that's just an editor. <laughs> It's like the moniker editor, but, uh, you know, it's like having a great producer or great engineer on like an album, you know, someone that can hear your music and go like, man, this sounds so good, but check out this idea. You know, what if you did this? What if you put a little bit of shadow under his eyes here? It'll make it even more insane. I'm not saying that Joe would need um, a reference to that, but things like that can really, really make things, um, more impressive. So this is funny because this actually reminds me a lot of Gen 13, the first miniseries that Campbell did 
Um, I mean, you can 100% see, uh, this is a reprint. Um, you can really see the Arthur Adams, like, long shot influence on Joe's early work. That's so funny. But yeah, this looks right out of Gen 13 miniseries number one. Oh, how funny. I have this comic. This isn't from the same issue, I don't think. Nice, nice spread. Really cool. This would take a while. This is a lot of work. This, this stuff. I think the John Romita Jr. Suicide Squad issue that had a character that was kind of made of this sort of material. And, uh, yeah, it was like, you just, you said it was a double page spread too, that it was on a lot. And then I remember looking at it and just going like, oh, this is going to take a while. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. Look at this. This is so detailed. This is early Joe. Well, and here's a good example of this too, is, is his first issues, it, it marvel on x-men i think he did was it he did two in a row and then he had a couple off he probably did this first book with this level of detail and then realized holy shit like how am i going to be able to do this like month after month you know and, and here's a funny thing i'll point this out uh, for people that are music fans um if you listen to the first alice in chains album versus the second one Lane really mellowed out the vocal lines because it's one thing to do it in the studio and it's another to take it on the road. And so he created vocal lines on Dirt that were easier to sing night after night after night. So even that comparison or analogy is so accurate to what I was talking about before where, you know, if you have any expectations of being able to be a prolific and productive artist, you really, really need to understand what you're capable of and what's capable of in a time frame. This is really cool. It's so fun to see these in black and white. Marvel should reprint everything in black and white. Oh, this is great. Damn, so cool. I feel like I'm playing a Zelda game. Let's do it. I don't know how well this will look, but we'll give it a shot. It's not too bad. I won't take it. Oh, I can probably take out a little bit more gray. If I take out too much, it'll start to deteriate the lines a little more. There we go. Let's see real quick. It's nice. Nicely laid out. Really big, fun shapes. Nice silhouettes. I would say Joe Joe is is uh, the silhouette guy. He uses lots of silhouettes, and, and on Battle Chasers in particular. I thought it was a really, really effective storytelling tool. I really liked it. And as long as they're well uh, designed and planned out and, and executed, it, it, it's, to me, um, not just a shortcut, but it actually looks really cool. This is such a great spread. Fuck, man. This is money right here. Man. Well, let's see. I'm black and white really quick. I'm kind of curious how empty it'll look. Obviously, the, the building outline was there, I'm sure. Yeah, it probably kind of looks like that. Yeah, the colors really give it a sense of um, depth. It's still very, very cool spread, though. Nice stuff. And this is a little a uh, little uh, echoing of uh, some of the monsters and battle chasers as, as it moved along. You can really kind of get a sense of that... Um, is it issue five that real weird sort of monster shows up this is nice too scott labdell i forgot that labdell wrote these that's funny and the colors is steve buccioletto and electric crayon which i have heard of i mean i know who steve buccioletto is or buccioletto buccioletto um but uh i remember electric crayon oh haha <laughs> The X-Men love to play baseball. There's a Michael Golden, Rick Leonardi. I've seen a few different guys. I think even Silvestri had some baseball in his. It's his American, his apple pie. Wow, look at that. I've never seen this spread before. Dude, I actually like the colors on this a lot. It's very, very colorful. Man, that's a cool drawing. Man, dude. That's neat. That's a great, that's a great, great spread and really beautiful inks. I like it. I am. Ooh, look at this. Yeah, I grabbed some spreads. Gotta have spreads. How fun. <laughs> Wolf Rain's got some crazy hair in these issues. He's all messed up. He turned into Pit. 
<laughs> He's very feral. Oh yeah, I have this issue too. Man, I need to organize my comic collection so bad. Ugh, it's 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 organized, but organized in a weird way right now. It was I started to separate what was valuable versus what wasn't, and I used to do it by artist more. But as more time went by, comic like certain comics would really go up in value, and it's like you're like all right, I gotta make sure that I take care of this one. So stuff is all split up now. This is so awesome. These these juggernaut pages are just so badass. Man, killed it with juggernaut. It's a great drawing. Really, really cool. Oh yeah. I think he did one of the issues was kind of a Christmassy story. That would be fun. He's done a couple of them. I, 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 I love Christmas comics. You know, a, a nicely drawn Christmas comic is always kind of fun. <laughs> he looks like young and kind of, it's weird. Oh, man. Okay, we're going to start to wrap this up. I need to get going. This video went longer than I thought. It was still fun though. Let's see what we got. Right. We'll go a little quick here for a second. Oh man, look at that. Damn, that's cool. So Matarero did breakdowns on this, and this is maybe Xander Cannon, Tim Townsend, Al Milgram did the finishes. This to me looks like what what ends up happening though is sometimes like when someone does breakdowns, they may have started the issue. This to me looks like this was full pencils by Joe. Um the face doesn't look exactly like Matarera, but um, he may have, as he got going along in the issue, needed to just do breakdowns. So there is a there is a chance that maybe the first four or five pages were fully penciled, but enough of them were breakdowns that they just went with that as a... crediting him that way. This is nice. Ooh. This almost has a Duncan Rouleau vibe. Matarera, Wow. Yeah, this looks like Duncan Rouleau, like on Alpha Flight. If you ever, the, dude, so Duncan Rouleau did a couple of issues of X Factor that are excellent. They're really, really good. If you like this right here, you will love them. And then his Alpha Flight comics are, are great too. So definitely seek that out. Duncan Rouleau is great. Highly, highly undervalued as an artist, I think. Guy, The guy is really, really talented. Great use of perspective and a lot of fun. Notion, Vince Russell, and Vince Russell ended up being the um, inker that did uh, Battle Chasers with him. Uh, the the preview of Battle Chasers. So this is Dan Green inks. This is early, early Metara. Early. I have this issue. It's nice, really nice inks on this. Townsend, of course. I have this comic too. So okay, all right. I'm gonna end it there. You guys have a great day. I will talk to you later, and uh, bye.